Okay. Welcome back, everybody, to BC 308, our class on Revelation and Daniel. We are in Daniel 7. We have a little bit more to complete uh, in this chapter. I, I see Abhishek's question. Uh, I have a question regarding the iron and clay. Does it also represent the mixture of AI technology and human? Okay. All right, uh, Abhishek. Every time we study scripture, we must always interpret scripture within you know what scripture is telling us. When the scripture is giving us the interpretation, then we shouldn't superimpose or bring to it a different meaning, right? So if you go back to chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, the meaning of every part of the image is already given to us. For example, in Daniel 2, he clearly says, you know, verse 38, you, he's telling Daniel 2.38, end of the verse, third verse, he says, you are the head of gold. That means, he's saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. That means gold represents the Babylonian kingdom, and it represents uh, the kingdom, right? So, Everything in Daniel 2, in that image, is representing a kingdom. So, silver represents a kingdom, brass represents a kingdom, iron represents a kingdom. So, you know, we cannot therefore bring in something of our own and ascribe it to what the Bible has already interpreted for us. So I cannot say, oh, gold represents the United States. I can't do that. Why? The Bible already said here, Daniel said, you are the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar. You want your kingdom, that's gold, right? So I have no, I cannot add, come in and put something. So, uh, and they explains everything. Right? So therefore, when he says iron mixed with clay, that he's already told us what iron is, right? Verse 40, iron is a fourth kingdom. Iron is not AI technology. Iron is not anything else. It's a fourth kingdom, correct? That's already, he told us what iron is. That's in Daniel chapter 2, verse 40. And therefore, when he continues in verse 41, and he says, iron will be mixed with clay. Hey, he already told us what iron is. Iron is the fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom is now going to be mixed with clay. And then he tells us what clay is. In verse 43, he says, the clay represents the seed of men, meaning all the other races people of all other kingdoms, right? So the scriptures have already interpreted this for us. What is iron? What is clay? Is already interpreted. So we should not, you know, it'll be wrong to ascribe a different meaning to iron than what is already given to us in scripture. Does that help, Abhishek? Okay, so let's go back to chapter 7. So we have looked at all the... Um, Shri Kumar, you have a question? Yes, yes, sir. I just want to know, uh, uh, then is, can we say that iron and clay uh, also can... Uh, the democracy represents iron and clay? Nowadays, now the kingdom is not there, but as you said, the, the weakness, so can we consider that? So, um, let's see. Um, so iron is mixed with clay. Now, what you're trying to say is, can that represent democracy? Um, see, democracy is a form 
of government. So here, what Daniel is telling us, I mean, in chapter two, he's saying iron, which represents, a, you know, the the fourth kingdom, which we understand, we know as the Roman Empire, that is mixed with clay, and he's basically talking about how people of that kingdom is, are going to be mixed with the rest of the seed of men, which is people of all other races, which is what has happened or is happening throughout Europe, right? And, you know, everywhere where the Roman Empire was, people are all mixed, um, everything's happened. Can we say that is democracy? Um, my 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 response to this is, see, he, the answer is no, because he's not really talking about. I mean, he's not really talking about the form of a form of government. Uh, that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is on the fact that there's an intermingling of what was part of what was previously part of the fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire, with all the other human races so that is the emphasis of uh, daniel chapter 2 and uh, what was was that uh verse 43 right um so that's the emphasis so the uh, and, and don't see any indication that he's trying to imply a form of government i think he, the, the focus of verse 43 daniel 2 43 is more of the intermingling that's happening as opposed to a democratic form of government because i mean yeah uh, that's that's my response to your question um yeah i i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't infer democracy from daniel 243 uh, yeah, I'm taking a little time to answer a question because first time somebody's asking me this question, uh, and I'm just thinking through on it. Um, yeah, I wouldn't infer democracy from those from Daniel two forty three because I feel the emphasis is more on the mixing of races and people as opposed to the form of government. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. So Daniel chapter seven. Um, so we we have uh, looked, you know, uh, in Daniel seven at the the beasts, the four beasts, the ten horns, the little horn, all that's going to happen. Now we need to look at what else Daniel saw. This is from verse nine. So. After he sees the beasts, the four beasts and all that, suddenly you can say the scene changes in the vision. And there's a fresh scene. Something completely different. He's seeing, verse 9, he's seeing thrones in place. And he sees the ancient of days. Right? And, and he just describes it. This is the father in all of his purity and wisdom hair is pure like wool and there's this, this throne like flames and wheels a burning fire so remember you know daniel is seeing a vision and he's describing in the language that he could what he's seeing so it doesn't mean that god's throne has wheels and you know god is in a wheelchair moving everywhere around heaven that's not it, though he says the throne has wheels. Okay, so he's just seeing this 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 amazing vision, and he's just using his language to describe what he's saying. Right now, you and I may use different language if we see the same vision. You know, we might see somebody. We might say, "Whoa, he is so bright," and. Uh, uh, you know, we may express or capture what we see in different words in, in language of today. Daniel's captured it in the language of his time. So he's just using, you know, 
hair like wool and garment white like snow and the throne was uh, as it was just just so powerful fiery flame and the wheels like burning fire but don't don't think you know the throne has wheels and so on so on he's just he's speaking just you know just to describe what he's saying and verse 10 there's a stream that came forth i mean that the glory of god the presence of god just streaming all you know out of that where god is and he's seeing thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people uh, ministering standing before god and seemingly he's saying the court was seated the books were open so it's almost like a great court heavenly court scene like god is there thousands of people are there and it's like okay god is sitting as judge so that's the thing right now uh, we don't have to say okay there's a literal court and you apply for your case and then you stand in queue to for your turn to come and then you appeal your case don't build all that i i wanted to use the word <laughs> nonsense but don't build all that kind of things no he's just communicating that fact that god is sitting as judge over all mankind that's who god is right so don't uh, don't add to that picture of a court scene and God being judged. Don't add what we do on earth, these kinds of things, to that court, right? And some people have done it and come up with all kinds of crazy theology. So don't do that. Basically, what he is saying is this ancient of days is God is judge over everybody. Everybody's standing before him. Okay. And then what happens? And there's, there's, you know, when this, this this whole thing is happening, basically that's the time, basically he's saying, verse 11 and 12, that's the end of this little horn who was speaking pompous words. Hey, he's just out of the picture. Verse 11, you know, that little horn. And in verse 11, he uses the phrase in the King James, sorry, the New King James, the beast, the, the beast in verse 11 is in the context of little horn. Okay, so that little horn, who is the beast, taken out of the picture, put into flaming fire. Verse 12, the rest of the beasts, okay, he saw four other beasts, right, earlier. They were also gone. But he says, their lives were yet their lives were prolonged for a season at a time. Meaning, those kingdoms are all gone, but uh, the the people uh, from those kingdoms, you know, continued for some time, which we know that would happen because when the saints inherit the kingdom and that kingdom is set up here on earth, they're going to rule over the world, which includes all of these kingdoms that were covered by these four beasts, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greeks, the Romans, and then the whole mix of people so the lives the, the kingdoms are gone nobody remembers babylonians medes and persians and greeks and all that but those people are there they are continuing on the earth for a season and a time meaning that we know it will, will be the millennium all those people will be on earth and the saints will rule over them okay that's verse 11 verse 12 then he goes back to seeing what happens in heaven verse 13 and i was watching the night vision that means he's look i'm continuing to look in this vision that i'm seeing at night and i see the one like the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven he came to the ancient of days they brought him near before him so the son of man this is the lord jesus christ or we could say the eternal word god the son he's coming in the clouds of heaven meaning that you know you can imagine that there's huge glory white clouds all around him so he's entering this awesome vision that's the ancient of days god the father thousands and thousands of people are all around him he is sitting as judge and here comes god the son into the presence of the father now this is very significant in helping us understand the godhead 
the triune God. So what do you mean? You see two persons, God the Father, God the Son, right? Then we can therefore say, okay, God the Holy Spirit is also a person, right? So the Godhead spoken of in Scripture is one God in three persons. These are distinct persons. God, the Ancient of Days, the Son of Man. That's what he's seeing in the vision, right? So it gives us clarity in understanding the Trinity or the Triune God of the Bible, right? Distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Distinct persons. Because the Son of Man is walking into the presence of the Father. The title Son of Man, as I mentioned earlier, I think last week or I mentioned earlier, that title is very important because Daniel is using this title here, Son of Man. Of course, he's, we saw it used in chapter 4. I mean, we didn't see it. It's, it is in chapter 4 uh, when, this, when, when Nebuchadnezzar sees, he says, I see a fourth man in the, in the fire. So this title, the Son of Man, is very unique. And it is what the Lord Jesus used for himself. And this is what made the Jews very angry. How could he, this a carpenter from Nazareth, how dare he self-reference himself as the Son of Man? I know. Many times we interpret Son of Man in the context of his humanity. There's nothing wrong with that. But correctly, the Son of Man is a title used by Daniel to refer to this eternal being, God, who came into the presence of the Ancient of Days. And Daniel uh, is using that title, uh, Jesus is using the title for himself while he was here on the earth. Okay, so the Son of Man, he sees the Son of Man coming, and then verse 14 to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all people should serve him, and his dominion is the everlasting dominion, and his kingdom will not be destroyed. So the kingdom was handed off to the Son of Man. Now we skip to the latter part. Of chapter 7, verse 26 27, the court was seated. They shall take away his dominion, that is, the, that, that beast, that little horn, and he'll be destroyed forever. And verse 27, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is the everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions shall serve him. So what's happening? Daniel saw, saw the ancient of days, he saw the Son of Man coming in, and all authority, dominion was handed to him on the earth, and he, then he turns it around and he gives it to the saints. Right? So that's the setup, that's what's going to happen in the millennium. The saints will rule the earth with the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Okay, so that this is Daniel chapter seven, beautiful chapter, right? It's just amazing details, but more details are to come in chapter eight and nine. He's going to explain further and further, give us more details. Okay, uh, let me pause here and just take up some questions. And um, let's see, Kennedy, where was Daniel when Shadrach, Mission, and Abednego were in the fire? Uh, just a side question. Yeah, so they were all there in King Nebuchadnezzar's uh, in in uh, in Babylon. Uh, Daniel was working uh, in King Nebuchadnezzar's palace, so he probably had a senior position. And remember, when Daniel was elevated, he also requested that Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego be given some important position in the court. So we don't know what their positions were, but they were also serving in the court, given some position, some work to do. I don't, we don't, I don't know what, 
work, work, was because Daniel requested, right? I'll make sure you give them something. And they were, they were all prepared for that. So maybe Daniel had a more senior position, a more prominent role. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego had uh, some sort of role in King Nebuchadnezzar's court. Later on in chapter 4, when this image, when Nebuchadnezzar made this image and said everybody must bow to it, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego refused to bow. Daniel must have been in the court, or we don't know, but he was not singled out at that moment. Be assured that he would not have bowed to the image. But these three boys, or young men, sorry, were singled out or caught not bowing to the image, and therefore they were dealt with. So Daniel must have been around, and you know, the Bible doesn't record anything, uh, tell us what he did, exactly did, but I, we can just use our imagination. Daniel must have been praying, and uh, you know, uh, he must have been saying, God, deliver them or something. And uh, yeah, so we, we know he was there, but what exactly he was doing, it's not recorded for us. Um, Elisha, in the present, who has dominion over the earth? So, that's interesting, because the Lord Jesus said in John 12, Now is the ruler of this world cast out. I'll give you the exact verse, John. Um, yeah, this is verse 31, all right? John 12, 31. Jesus said, Now the ruler of this world is cast out. And uh, in John 16, Jesus said that the ruler of this or the, the ruler of this world is judged or condemned or you know he's sentenced. This is in uh, John 16 and verse 11. So, when Christ died on the cross and did finish his work, Satan was dethroned. Satan was condemned. Yet, when the Apostle Paul is writing later, he refers to Satan in, with this language. He refers to him in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. He refers to him as the God of this world. In Ephesians 2, he refers to him as the prince of the power of the air. Jesus said, Satan is cast out. Satan is judged. We know Colossians 2, Jesus disarmed principalities and powers. Hebrews 2, Jesus destroyed the one who has the devil. Matthew 28, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Then, how could the Apostle Paul refer to Satan as the God of this world? Isn't it contradictory? How could the Apostle Paul refer to Satan as the prince of the, ruler, prince of the power of the air? Isn't it contradicting what Christ did? It's not, because Jesus representing the human race overthrew Satan and all his demonic powers. But Satan is Satan's disarmed, but he's given time to continue doing whatever he's doing here on earth until Revelation 20, verse 15. I mean, uh, sorry, until Revelation 20, verse 4, which is the beginning of the millennium. Then he'll be taken out for a thousand years, and then he'll give, be given again a brief period of time, and then finally, Revelation 2015, he'll be fully, finally banished. But until Revelation 20, verse 4, Satan has continued to, given permission to continue operations on the earth. But remember, in Christ, he, Satan and all his demonic powers are actually disarmed before those who are in Jesus Christ. So, 
in one sense he's still the god of this world because he's continuing to hold sway over the people who are in darkness influence them work in them so on and in another sense he is completely powerless before the believer because all authority that Christ has is now exhibited or is now being exercised through the church so to answer your question who has dominion of the earth it really depends on which side you are on if somebody is on the side of darkness then for that person Satan is exercising control for those of us who are in the kingdom of light we are in control we are in charge because we have authority and power over Satan and his demons and this will continue till the millennium when Satan is removed the beginning of the millennium when Satan is removed from the earth so did I answer your question Elisha was it, is that clear Okay. Um, yeah, Kennedy. Um, I wish we did the historical part of this book. Yeah, so I kind of presented that in the very beginning, the opening introduction chapter. We went through the history. And uh, so if you go back to the very first lesson in the notes, the entire history, starting from Abraham, or from the very beginning all the way till... Um, till when? Till uh, from ninety, you know, from the Assyrian Empire all the way till the Revolt of the Maccabees is is outlined for us, and uh, so the history is available. And also, I could refer you back to what we did last year in the End Times, where we uh, looked at the history of Israel. We started off from Abraham all the way to the establishing of Israel as a nation uh, and then that covers a lot of you know what happened uh, in terms of uh, history in the, the context of which Daniel 7 comes in okay uh, if you want a lot more detail then I would refer you to one of the PDFs that I've shared uh, by David Woolward uh, and there's a lot of content that you could read there, historical content that you could read through that PDF. Now, you know, uh, it's a huge book and it, there's a lot of content. So now if you're interested in the historical part, you can definitely read through that. Uh, I'm just, you know, presenting it in the context with some background. Okay. All right. Very good. Any other questions um, on Daniel 7? Go ahead, Asha. Um, sorry, Pastor, just want to know. Uh, here in the Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, it talks about the Son of Man, right? So, um, like, is it considered as one of, like, the prophecy of, uh, like, who Jesus is going to, like, how the book of Isaiah is mentioned? Okay. So your question is, is Daniel 7 a prophecy of who Jesus is going to be? Like how Isaiah foretells, for example, about the birth of Christ and so on. So you're saying, is it a prophecy of who he is going to be? That's your question. Is that correct? Yes, Pastor. Please, like, how uh, he, like, like how I know, I'm not kind of understanding because everything okay. place takes in the book of uh, Matthew and words about who Jesus is, like he was born physical and all this stuff. And the book of Isaiah talks about uh, his um, death and all this uh how he was martyred in all for us, like not martyred, crucified for us. And here, how they mention about the Son of Man. So I'm just wondering, like, 
all this how it is connected so okay okay here's a simple explanation everything we read about Jesus in his glory as after his resurrection that is the same and equal to everything we read about Jesus who he was before the incarnation that means the Jesus after his ascension is the same as the Jesus before the incarnation with only one difference the only one difference is that Jesus after the ascension has a glorified body that means the Jesus before the incarnation the eternal word is the same as the Jesus after the ascension he's still the eternal word but when he ascended he ascended with a glorified body a spirit body now but in terms of deity the same it's not like you know so Daniel is Daniel 7 13 he's seeing one like the son of man to whom the kingdoms are over given well the son of man that Daniel sees in Daniel 7 13 is the same at the time Daniel was writing this which was before the incarnation he's the same person same glory same deity everything except that now when he ascended he ascended with a glorified body so in our minds we should be very clear that the eternal word who became the son of God Jesus Christ and when this Jesus ascended he received he he became the same as he was how do we know that John 17 and verse um, I think it's verse 5 let me give you the exact verse John 17 verse 5 it says father John 17 verse 5 Jesus is praying he says father glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was so imagine this Jesus is on the earth in a physical body as the Son of God he's praying to God the Father he says father glorify me that means give me something I don't have right now glorify me what's he asking for the glory which I had with you before the world was that means in the eternal past so after Jesus' ascension what happened he was given the glory that he had with the father before the world was so the son of man Daniel sees in Daniel 7 uh, verse 13 oh sorry yeah verse 13 is the Jesus who was who has the glory the same glory that he had before the world was does it make it clear yes master thank you okay all right any other questions from daniel 7 okay so let's go to Daniel chapter 8 okay now Daniel chapter 8 is again very interesting but in Daniel 8 he focuses in on certain things it's like you know if you're looking at a magnifying glass if you see from a distance you're seeing the full picture now you bring the magnifying glass a little closer you're zooming in on certain parts of the big picture that has been presented to us from chapter 2 and elaborated for us in chapter 7 so uh, once again we need to read the entirety of Daniel chapter 8 
um, and then you know uh, start getting into it uh, and seeing what is there. Uh, I, I see we have 10 minutes. I think we should be able to read uh, Daniel 8 in 10 minutes, I think. So let's do that. Let's try to do that. I want to encourage everybody, uh, you know, uh, let's go through it three verses at a time. Let's try to read Daniel 8, please. Daniel 8, verse 1 to 3. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa, in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. Canal. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other one, the other part grew up later. Thank you. I saw the other ram charging westward and northward and southward. No, no beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns which I had seen standing on the back of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. Okay. Thank you. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him, and struck the ram, and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no and there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then, the goat became exceedingly great. But when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of the, inst and instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Thank you. Daniel 8 from 10. It grew great even to the host of heaven, and some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host, and the regular burnt offerings was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And the host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offerings because of transgression, and it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and the another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man voice between the banks of the Ulai who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision 
refers to the time of the end. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and, and stood me upright. And he said, look, I am making known to making known to you what shall happen in the later time of the indignation. For at the appointed time an end shall be. And the ram and the ram which you saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece, the large horn that is between its eyes, is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of that kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his holy, uh, through his policy, he shall cause trickery to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart and mind, and in the security he will corrupt and destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken, and that by no human hand. The vision of the evening and the morning which, which has been told you is true. But seal up the vision, for it has to do with and belongs to the now distant future. Uh, and I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for several days. Afterward, I rose up and did, and did the king's business. And I wondered at the vision, but there was no one who understood it or would mm. make it understood. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. So, very interesting. Daniel, has, you know, again, he's, he has recorded this vision, which he had earlier, previously, during the time of Belshazzar. In this vision, he's seeing two different animals. He's seeing a ram, and he's seeing a goat. Now, as before, the interpretation is given to us in this same chapter. So let me ask you, what does the ram represent? What does the goat represent, the male goat? The ram represents the king of media and Persia, and the goat or shaggy goat represents the king of Greece. Perfect. Thank you. So right there, right there in verses 20 and 21, the angel Gabriel speaking to Daniel has told him, Daniel, you're seeing these two animals fighting, but these two animals, you know, the ram and the goat, they're actually representing these kingdoms. Now remember, he saw this vision at the time of Belshazzar, that means in the Babylonian, while he was still under the Babylonian kingdom. So God is showing a him ahead of time and saying, hey, you know, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks. So Daniel is being a given vision ahead into time of coming world empires. And Daniel is in the time of the Babylonians, the Belchers are. And the meaning of these animals or you know is given right there. So he sees uh, verse three, he sees a ram that is moving westward. So that means Medes and Persia basically is covering in today's map would be the region for of Iran and Iraq, the Medes and the Persians. He's seeing this ram. It has two horns. One is small, one is big. 
the small one represents the Medes who took over power, but then they lasted just a short time, and then the Persians, you know, took over and were in power longer and more powerful. But this ram with two horns represents the Medes and the Persians, the Persian being the bigger horn, the higher horn. And they moved westward. So obviously, they're moving from the region of Iran and Iraq, and they are occupying, you know, Turkey and all of those, those regions around the Mediterranean. They're occupying those areas. They're moving westward, which is exactly what happened, how they expanded their empire or their kingdom. Now, after that comes a male goat. And verse 20 says, that's the kingdom of Greece. Interesting. And he is moving eastward. That means from Greece, he's moving in the other direction. And he went all the way. Uh, you know, uh, So there was a very prominent goat horn. Horn represents a leader, which was Alexander the Great. And he moved all the way, came up all the way to India. So from Greece, he moved eastward. He overpowered the ram, that is the Medes and the Persians. Okay, I will pause here. Uh, we will get into the details of chapter 8 next class. Um, so take some time to read chapter 8 and look at all the details, because here we see he's talking about Alexander the Great, he talks about his four generals who came in after him, he talks about the fact that Alexander the Great died very suddenly, that's in verse 8, and um, and then he tells us where the Antichrist will come from. He says in verse 9, he tells us where the little horn will come from. So a lot of additional details here in Daniel 8, which we will get into next week. Okay, all right, let's, um, uh, let's close. And we will um, please take a break, and I will see you in the um, the next class. Okay, thank you, everyone. God bless. See you soon. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you.